to the assigned variable. This is not allowable. You must put them into a single transaction. This is the only assumption we make for autonomous. Then it's easier to combine those uh, uh, assignment statements together because in my language, I don't have parallel conversion. So there's no any interference which can be introduced in the middle of sequential composition. This is the end of laws. So I think the set of laws is straight, quite straightforward. Now my job left is to transform a final program into a final normal form based on the idea of the law. The second step is I like to have a limit operator in my language to link final program with non-termination program. Just like in the number theory, you treat uh, real number as the limit of uh, rational number. And as a, another job is I have to prove all the programming combinations are continuous. Of course, you can do different sort of models to uh, demonstrate this type of problem. And finally, we show you how to convert a program into a sending chain of finite number form. This job is very similar to what we did in the UTP book. We have finite number form, we define if and all form as the limit of finite number form. Jonathan, remind me how much time I have. Uh, well, maximum half an hour. Yeah, yeah. Depends how many questions you got. <laughs> the final form has this sort of style. It has a non terminal choice as the outermost operator. And it integrates a collection of probability choice. It's very similar to what we have for a conventional program language. The only difference is convenient program language we have conditional choice inside non-term choice. And now I have probability choice inside non-term choice. So they are very similar. And now you can prove final normal form of codes. Very, very uh, straightforward. I will not show you all. Then you can prove any final program can be uh, transformed into a final normal form in this argument. Mm -hmm. Now I'll begin with the definition for the final order. Actually, I will use five refinement rules. Uh, take a bottom-up approach. First, I compare simple programs, saying which one is better than the other one. Then I show you how to deal with non different choice. Finally, I tell you how to handle limit. So there are state, three states. The first stage is if we have PQ, both are final normal forms. If you are asked to prove P actually finds Q in the algebra, what actually you have to deliver is to show each element in the set B defines program Q in algebra. So we allocate this refinement uh, responsibility to every element in the set B. This is quite natural because P is the not in the choice of this collection of final norms. Then we have to ask ourselves how to establish the fact PI actually finds Q in algebra. So the second rule is quite subtle. PI can be verified as the final Q 
if you can find a sequence of non-negative expressive with these constraints, <coughs> the sum equals one, and then you can prove PI defines the right-hand side probability choice. So here I have convex closure property in my mind. I say if we like to prove PI defines Q, you must be able to find a convex closure of Q such that PI is simplified. There is no simple <coughs> explanation here, but actually this is a closure step. Each element in set C has some contribution to the final operation of Q. <coughs> so you must put them together. This is the second rule. And the final tell you how to compare two uh, probability choice. This is P defines Q. If P gives you more information over individual output. That's all. So this first three rules to deal with a simple uh, construct. And then I have another two rules. Oh, here I can prove. Uh, non disney choice actually plays the role as a final order in this <coughs> algebra. So we are happy. We cover the same definition used in the YouTube book. In the YouTube book, we usually define the order in terms of non the choice. So here I take another way to tackle the final order. We cover this older definition again. An infinite normal form in this language <coughs> is represented by a infinite sequence of final normal form. So inside this brackets, SI is the final normal form. Uh, they satisfy this uh, ascending property. It means SI is plus one is always defined of SI. So when you go step forward, you get a much refined result. This is the only uh, constraints we put forward for this sequence. <laughs> and now we have to compare two infinite programs and we add two new rules says if we like to prove the left hand side T is the refinement of right left of right hand side T is the refinement of left hand side S what do you have to do here to check if T actually defines each element in S as well. Because you take limit, you must guarantee T is above every element in this sequence S. And the second rule says if you like to compare a finite normal form with infinite normal <coughs> form, now you have to go back to consider every initial state to see SI is actually defined by a corresponding Tj on this new state. So I have presented all the refinement rules. Total number is five. That's all. Now I can show you an example. The first example says that the right hand side that is a atomic action which assign zero to variable V. However, the left hand side is a very lazy group. It is hesitating to produce value, uh, value zero for V. In the first step, it just says V has a value zero with probability 
zero point five. I tell you another zero point five power gain for the next step. In the second step, it add another one quart probability to assign value zero to one. So in total, now we see the variable v has zero as zero as a value with probability three quarts. If you go forward, you will increase probability for v getting value zero. But anyway, there is no final step which can end this execution. So according to the previous rules, we can prove radical side in the final or left hand side. However, you can also prove the left side cannot refine right hand side. So they are different. <coughs> One is the final program, another is the different program. Then people may argue that is it possible to define a non-termination program by a termination one? My answer is this is not always the case. It is. In this example, we have a program which we are not terminates. It will produce natural number gradually. And we can prove there is no way you can find a final normal form P satisfy this inequality. The reason is very clear because as a final program, it can only produce five number of outputs. So there is no comparison between final number with infinite number of outputs. So this means that the relationship between non termination program and the community program is quite subtle in this language. It's not very straightforward. <coughs> I will skip some slides here and, and I will show you that you can equip, recover all the models in UTP for this language. So I quite like Now I have to explore the type of so called observations. First, what is the test case for this language? We are quite lucky we can use the test case for data command language for our case. It's a total assignment, <coughs> assign constants A, B, and C to corresponding variable X, Y, Z. So you fix initial state. <coughs> then you execute sequence competency. You hope you will see some uh, visible observation. And now we say we can prove if Q refines P in algebra, then the testing process also establishes the same effect. So algebra has a consistent testing procedure. They are the same. Now we have to explore the type of so-called observable. In my case, observable has quite a complicated structure. It's not a single state. It's in a sequence of probability state. <coughs> it allows you to specify this non-termination process. So each element SI itself <coughs> is a probability choice. <coughs> over total assignment state. So you can regard that each SI itself is a distribution function over the variable B. Then put the limit. And this is the so-called probability state. Now you can treat each program and the mapping from the new state to the, to the probability states. You can define simple ordering, then you can prove this ordering is consistent with the algebra. And actually, I can omit all the proof <coughs> because for different languages, we follow the same pattern of proof. And Tony told me this afternoon, said that we like to 
symbol time, we like to have pattern of proof. So we never need to control proof every time. We just say they have the same pattern. And now I have to go down to the final stage. For the language we have, the transition term have two types. The first type talk about so-called uh, inter internal transition. So computation has two arguments. One is the current state, S, and the second is the program text. So internal choice goes from one configuration to another configuration. The second type transition involves the probability. You see, first configuration transfer to the second configuration with probability R. You get a little bit more information about this sort of transition. So we have two types. Of course, uh, two types give us some difficult to give a consistent definition in the end. Also, I can define what it means <coughs> that this tree is divergent. In the convention language, when you say a tree is divergent, it just means there is an infinite path of tall transitions. But this is not the case in this language. Because you have to consider the possibility of an infinite transition based on probability choice. There is no internal choice. So every step makes probably a choice. It will never produce a meaningful output. So next step, it will repeat the same choice again and again. So the first sort of divergence is caused by a tree without a leaf. <coughs> because the leaf gives you the final state. But if a tree has no leaf at all, of course, the really means it gives me no information at all. The second kind of transition is we have an infinite number of tall transitions. So when you put them together, I end up with a quite complex definition for so-called divergence. A configuration is treated as a divergence when if either the transition tree is root has no leaf, or it has an infinite Pass of tall transition, or one of its tall successor is divergent, or or probability choice uh, successor are divergent. So you have four possibilities. First two are basis for induction. The induction is based either on non-trivial <coughs> choice. Or, or probability choice. So this mean, means we have new uh, notation of divergence for this language. Now I can talk about what, what it means consistency. I think no program can perform tall transition and uh, R transition at the same time. Either it makes probability choice or it makes a mountain choice. There is no mixture of two choices at the same stage. Just like I would pick, play games, each side has its own turn. The second condition says every time when they make a choice, the number of the choice from branch is finite. <coughs> so each step they only can uh, do find a finite number of choices. The third one says, if a combination diverges, the really means the testing will not produce meaningful result. The final one says, any transition <coughs> will keep all the information contained by its predecessor. So if a program configuration can make probably choice, you put all the success together, <coughs> you will cover the same information for us. Similarly for the non-same choice. So 
This is a set of rules which guide you to design original cements. No more, no less. It's a sufficient and necessary condition for consistency. Here I have proof in the end. <coughs> because we talk about approximations, so we have to uh, demonstrate how to cut an infant tree into a family of final tree, uh, each of which represents one of the final approximations. So the way I have a sub-index N to stand for the length of each tree and tell you how to link the semantics of big tree with sub-tree. When you put all the tree together, you, you recover the testing semantic. So everything is matched together with this alpha. This is the end of my talk. Many thanks for your attention. Any questions? I think we still have time for questions. Well, should we do the questions first and then I'll say something? We've got a microphone because we're recording. So. Ryan Bill Stoddart from Middlesbrough. You, is, did I see that a probabilist, an empty probabilistic choice was equal to a board? Yes. That seems counterintuitive to me. So I suppose an empty, um, an empty non-deterministic choice would also be a board. Yeah. Yes. Because we had two laws showing that this is the case. Did you have a choice when you made these? You could, could, you could have had a, an empty non-deterministic choice being magic, for example. No. That's not a possible choice for you. Because this is a modern language. I'm not allowed to introduce a miracle in a modern language. Otherwise, everybody becomes so easy. Just write down miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else like to take the microphone? There'll be questions in a moment, so. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very attractive approach. Have you uh, extended it to um, a reactive probabilistic language? No. Mm -hmm. I plan to put a probability uh, on event B as the first step. Because event B was widely used in uh, Chinese industry community. But they don't know how to tackle uh, probability choice in a non deterministic language. But in principle, the most difficult for this approach lies on the construction of algebra laws. So I think the selecting of atomic action is a crucial step. Then you have to decide which type of operator will be left in your normal form. In my language, I suggest that even in a game theory, you only need to play game once <coughs> because you only have one non-game choice plus another probability choice. So there are no next competition between the environment with the system itself. This makes our job uh, and that's just easy, I think. I also like to use tools to perform this sort of system analysis. Anyone? Yes, I thought so. Thank you very much. That's a very um, comprehensive way of deriving a denotational semantics from an algebraic semantics. And it reminds me of the, uh, almost by definition, uh, you, since your, your denotations are all textual, you're defining something like a final algebra or a given um, a final algebra for a given set of algebraic uh, properties. Is that is a yeah. reasonable, very brief summary of what you have achieved? 
Because the photo I have uh, read from the mathematics is when I talk about atomic actions, actually there are some mathematical meaning attached with those atomic actions. Mm -hmm. I can talk about state change. Mm -hmm. But I never show you what it means state change in competition sense. So I treat it as atomic action. So in this way, I will be able to use text to assign your algebra meaning. Otherwise, everything is text. You don't know what you really talk about. In my own, in my own practice, I've seen algebra most often derived, or um, the proof to be done in the other way, that you <coughs> prove that a given denotational semantics, which may include denotations which are not texts, things that happen in the outside world, for example, um, and then prove that it satisfies the algebraic laws that you want. Um, and that, so I say, is the bottom-up approach. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. You've taken a top-down approach, but this means that your models are are all of a particularly syntactic kind, just like the final algebra models in category theory. Uh, they are different because in uh, classical algebra, they talk about uh, initial model. However, it's not easy to explain the initial model from the IGS itself. So my approach is, I still like to keep all necessary semantic information inside this initial algebra. So I can talk about state of change. I can talk about what means observable <coughs> in the executions. So it's initial algebra rather than final algebra, of course. Uh, yes, David, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Butler from Southampton. Um, I think at the beginning of your talk you said that the work that you're presenting allowed you to correct a mistake that you've made many years ago. Yeah. Can you say what that mistake was? At that time, that? when we regarded the program in the mapping from initial state of variables to a finite distribution of states, I have not taken infinite number of outputs into consideration. So what was the consequence of that mistake? You, you this means when you calculate a fixed point, yeah. you have not get a fixed point in your domain. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> what else? Oh, waiting for your cake. There, there is cake, by the way, covered. <laughs> but you, you will have to wait slightly longer. Shall I, shall I Jim is going to give a, a summary. Okay. Perhaps we could give a. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to um, um, mirror what uh, Tony did at the beginning. He talked about the origins of UTP, and I wanted to talk about where it's going. Uh, from here. But first of all, I, uh, I'd like to tell you a story about um, the book and uh, um, back in 1998, uh, Tony was retiring from Oxford uh, and he went, of course, to work for Microsoft. And so we held a, a retirement symposium, a three-day uh, symposium with uh, a very large number of speakers because everybody accepted the invitation to speak. And uh, the arrangements for the, uh, for the symposium were going rather well until a couple of weeks before the symposium, Tony said to me, do you know what I think would be nice? To give a copy of our new book to every participant. Right? And uh, so, I, <laughs> yes, that would be very, very nice indeed. And so I, I, um, I sent an email to Helen Martin at, uh, at Prentice Hall and said, um, I wonder if you could send me 300 copies of <laughs> Unifying Theories of Programming. She was delighted. So um, about a week before the symposium, they turned up in, 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 in brown cardboard boxes 
with an alarming white envelope with an invoice inside. <laughs> and uh, the invoice was um, uh, not quite as large as I feared because I got two pounds discount on, on every copy uh, of the 300 books. Um, so um, the, uh, the, uh, the symposium passed off very well and people were very you know, grateful to have this book. And a few years later I had a doctoral student who needed a copy of Unifying Theories. And it was out of print. So he looked at Amazon. He found uh, a copy for sale for £50 on Amazon Germany. So he, uh, he spent my grant money on this, on, this, on this book. And it came through the post. And he was delighted by it because it was absolutely pristine. It had never been opened. <laughs> Except that when he opened the cover, there were two names inside. Tony's name, because he'd signed these books and the name of one of the participants from the symposium. <laughs> now, I tell you this story so that I can claim what I think is a unique position in the history of UPP. Not only have I bought more copies of the book than anybody else, I've even bought some of them more than once. <laughs> and the other story I wanted just to mention was, um, in 2000, I too went on sabbatical, and I took the book with me. And uh, I worked uh, uh, my way through with, with my host, we had a reading party on the book in Brazil, Augusto Sampaio's research group. And we worked our way through the book and we did every single proof and we didn't let anything go. And so we got to chapter eight. <laughs> and we were in chapter eight and there's a, 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 a definition of hiding and, and some theorems that, that follow from it. And we just couldn't get it. And we, we worked for weeks on this to try to understand. And eventually the penny dropped and we had an insight and we realised well, that's really, really, really nice. And a few, uh, a few weeks later, um, I, I met Jifang and I said, you know, was this right? Was my, you know, the insight I finally got from this definition, was that correct? And he said, yes, of course, that's right, well done. And I said, well, why didn't you explain it? And he said, well, if we had explained everything, the book would be this thick. <laughs> And I think uh, that's one of the reasons why it's such a rewarding read, because uh, you know, there are many insights to be had, even if you have to work really quite, quite uh, hard at them. Um, one of the first projects we had um, arising from unifying theories in Oxford was a project called Linking Tools Through Unifying Theories. And uh, that became a kind of motto for much of the research I've done since about building tool chains out of heterogeneous modelling languages and their tools. One of the things we tried to do was to build a theorem prover uh, for UTP. And it's, I think, taken 20 years for us to get to a stage where we're, we're proud of an implementation of UTP in a mechanical theorem prover, and that's Isabel UTP. And I think it has uh, um, some insights uh, about um, resolving the best way of, of implementing a language like that, mixing both uh, shallow and deep embeddings to, to get the right amount of, of uh, automation and leverage from a, a language like that. We finally found a good way of implementing state through uh, theories of lenses and so on. And so I think we've now got something that's very, very useful. So looking towards the future, uh, I think we get more and more uh, theories implemented in, uh, um, in Isabel UTP. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the, the directions that we should be going in that we shouldn't be devising theories unless we can, can really mechanise them and have a theorem prover for them at the same time. Um, a number of projects came out of all this. I've had a series of EU projects. Thank you for your, your Brexit <laughs> jokes at the beginning. Uh, I've had a series of EU jokes. Uh, EU jokes. <laughs> <laughs> a series of EU projects um, built on top of, of UTP where UTP has, has provided the foundations for those, for those projects in modelling uh, cyber-physical systems, in modelling uh, 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 mobile and autonomous uh, robotics. And uh, some of this has now got into practical use in industry. We have, um, uh, for example, we have uh, um, uh, a company in Denmark that we collaborated with, um, AgroIntelli, and they make um, uh, robots for the agricultural world. So they make light um, uh, weight uh, tractors that do interesting things. Now, the way they de design their products is to design through soft models. And these soft models are high <coughs> um, uh, heterogeneous uh, models. So there's continuous parts, there's, there's cyber parts, and all these things have to work together. And so they have a, a, a process based 
on linking tools for uh, um, uh, Simulink and Medelica and 20SIM and VDMRT and other tools like that. And what makes it all work at the end of the day is UTP. And they, they design uh, products. You can experience them through virtual and uh, augmented reality tools based on gaming engines and programmed in languages like Unity and so on. And you can experiment these things and decide whether you want to buy uh, such a product. And they don't, they don't uh, um, build a, a, a real physical prototype uh, and, until they have a, a customer for, uh, for the particular product. And uh, the customer um, will have gained enough experience from, from playing around with these models in order to be able to make a, a reasoned judgment about buying it. Um, our current work in, 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 in York is... is based on, on, on UTP, uh, the, the RoboStar projects, RoboCalc, RoboTest, uh, I know that some, uh, some of you know about the, these, these sorts of uh, uh, projects that we're engaged in at the moment, and they're firmly based on top of UTP. So I see the future as being more industrial applications of um, uh, theories based on UTP, which seems to scale up to industrial use. We're already uh, formalizing uh, languages and notations that are um, of interest to, to, to industry, like UML, SysML, um, uh, Simulink and Stateflow and those sorts of languages, diagrammatic languages that have underneath, underneath them these powerful tools. Um, industry is really interested in this issue of heterogeneous modelling. There's the, the, the functional mock-up interface, FMI, which is a way of, of, of people in industry collaborating without sharing their, their, their intellectual property. So they, they perhaps build a, a soft car with uh, the drivetrain and the, the, the brakes and the, the, uh, uh, the communication system inside the car. All of this modelled and then wrapped up, each modelling language, each model wrapped up with its own solver as a, an executable, so as a, a black box, <coughs> and then put together. So industry does this kind of thing. We can explain the theory behind those sorts of industrial uses of multi-modeling using UTP. So um, that's where I see things going. That's where I see uh, um, the, the real action being taking these ideas out into industry. Now, I was asked to sum up the, the previous talk. I shan't do that. Um, I think that, uh, that the, 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 the problem of uh, probabilistic modelling and its interaction with non-determinism is a long-standing and really interesting problem and UTP has provided the framework for tackling that kind of problem and that's one of its strengths. So I think we'd all be happy now if you want to ask any further questions before we uh, adjourn for the cake. <laughs> So any last questions? They're questioning that week. <laughs> well, thank you very much for all three speakers. It's been a wonderful evening. Uh, we know that 20 years ago we had a unifying series of programming. I'm also looking ahead. And perhaps in 20 years' time, one of you will be writing a, a book called Unified Theories of Programming. So we hope that's where we're going to go with UTP at least. I, I, I keep saying unified rather.